What's up guys? We're uh, going to take a few minutes and talk about filling out the roofing replacement agreement. Um, so I'll try to keep this simple, but some of this stuff is a little, you know, there's a lot of variables and, and uh, you know, it's not the most exciting stuff, but um, what is exciting is making money. So, you know, sometimes we got to deal with going through a, a couple of these boring videos um but uh keep an, keep an eye on the light at the end of the tunnel so anyway um here's the scenario uh you've knocked the door you file a claim a week later the insurance company comes out they approve the roof you take a bunch of photos um you do your roof sculpt form which looks like this right here so you, you do your roof scope form, you fill it out, you get all the necessary pictures, you email that in to the office, right? And then you do your GAF Hover 360 report. So now we've got a roof scope. The estimators and production team in the office can look at all that information you've sent in and they know how to correctly write an estimate for that property now and they know what materials need to be ordered. Um, later on once you put your your roofing order in right so anyway you've done you filed the claim you've done the adjustment it's been approved you've sent in a scope and then either that day the insurance adjuster writes up a estimate and gives it to you and the homeowner or he mails it out a week later and you get a copy of that itemized insurance estimate homeowner gives it to you and now we're ready to order a roof right um so we're there with the client. We pick out a color. He wants a, a GAF Weatherwood shingle. Perfect. Okay, here we go. Let's order the roof, right? Well, what do we have to do? We have to fill out this roofing replacement agreement, right? It's fairly simple, you know, um, as long as you understand what's going on here. Um, so the top, you know, name, address, city, state. It's all the homeowner's information, right? Basic stuff. Um and then now we go down here, buildings for replacement, right? So this is something where when you get into this, you want to look at the insurance paperwork, right? You want to verify, hey, did the insurance company pay for just the house or did they pay for the shed too, right? is there a shed on the property? You know, sometimes people miss the shed at the adjustment because it'll be tucked away in the back of the property under a tree, you don't even see it until you get ready to order the roof and the homeowner's asking, hey, you guys doing the shingles on the shed too? And then you say, wait a second, I didn't even know there was a shed, right? So it's something you wanna check when you're meeting the insurance company. Otherwise you gotta do a reinspection or go look and see if there is damage, send those to the insurance company. So anyway, that's why we ask, um, it's why it's on the sheet because we wanna know, right? We don't want there to be confusion. So this sheet is as much for our company as it is for the client. We wanna have a good sound understanding of what's expected to be replaced and what we're using for replacement materials, right? It's the whole purpose of this sheet. Uh, it's transparency and expectations, right? It's, uh, it's an agreement. So, Anyway, buildings for replacement. You circle whatever ones apply. Um, I'm just going to fill this out. We'll just put homeowner name, John Anderson, address 123 Main Street, City, call it Blaine, Minnesota. I don't know the zip code up there, 55448, I think. That's Green Rapids, but... Homeowner's phone number, we'll just call it 763-123-1234. Sales rep, Charlie. Don't mind my sloppy handwriting. We're going kind of quick here. So anyway, we're going to just say if we're doing just the home uh, on this property. If we were doing the shag or the detached garage, we would circle that stuff too. Um, shingle brand, our typical is GAF, model, Timberline color um, in this case we'll just go with weathered wood pretty common one right dumpster location so here we go so when we drop the dumpster we want to know 
left side or right side? Or is there a weird specialty spot? We're not typically gonna ever put it in the grass, even if the homeowner wants it in the grass. Uh, it, it'll really damage things. I mean, it's, you know, so let's keep it in the driveway. Uh, street isn't really usually an option either. Uh, most cities don't allow a dumpster to be in the street, even with the permit. Um, so again, we like to keep the dumpster in the driveway. Um, usually we like to get it close to the garage or the house. So that way when guys are tearing the shingles off, they can throw them right in the dumpster. If the homeowner has, uh, you know, a special driveway that was just done, um, and he's afraid of the driveway being damaged, um, we can order a trailer out there. So we'll have the roofers bring a trailer on wheels. Um, if that's the case, you just write trailer in, right? So it's either, you know, left or right side typically, or otherwise put in trailer. Um, trailers are, you know, easy enough to obtain, but you know, they're not, it's not the standard way we do it. Um, the roofers do charge more, um, to bring the trailer out, empty it and, and that kind of stuff. So we, we tend to stick with the dumpster. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, in this case, we're just going to put left side okay now we talk about valleys open or closed so a lot of this stuff you're going to do whatever they currently have right open valleys are valleys where you can see a little bit of valley metal there will be a w valley in there um, that's pretty common probably the most common up here in minnesota some people do have closed valleys that's where shingles overlap in the valley those are fairly common too um so I would just usually keep what they have, maybe confirm that with the homeowner. As far as performance, one isn't really better than the other. I mean, really it's an aesthetic thing. They both work great, um, you know, so uh, I wouldn't worry too much uh, about that. But what you do wanna worry about is that the homeowner uh, confirms which one they want. And, and again, usually you're going back with the same thing. I've had it in the past where this wasn't confirmed Back when I worked for other companies, we didn't have a sheet like this, right? And, um, you know, the homeowner would have closed valleys. We go out, put the new roof on, we do open valleys, and all of a sudden the homeowner wouldn't like it, right? Big problem. You're looking at about a six, $7,000 repair, you know, if it's a decent sized roof. So we'd have to go out there, and I, I've, I saw this happen a couple times. Crazy. We go out there, take out the open valley, put in new underlayment, put in new shingles, and, and basically redo the whole valley sections, right? Major repair, terrible. So um, again, but you know, this, that's why we're going through this sheet. So most of the time they're open. So in this case, I'm just gonna choose open. Um, underlayment, synthetic is what we use standard. Um, 15 pound felt is kind of the old material that they use underneath shingles that goes on if there's sections of the roof that are lower than 412 pitch, um, we, we have to put it on a double, double layer, right? So, um, you know, we put that on there and it makes a little note here. Um, two layers of felt are required with areas lower than 412 pitch. Rolled roofing sections. Well, rolled roofing comes in three foot wide rolls that adheres. There's a kind of a adhesive ice and water shield or it's called modified bitumen. It's an underlayment that goes on and then you put the rolled roofing on on top. It's basically just asphalt roofing, looks like a shingle, but it's just flat and smooth. Three foot wide rolls. I'm not sure how long they are, probably 30, 40 feet. Um, that goes on, it's required in areas with a 212 pitch or less. So basically almost flat areas, right? Um, it's not super common, you run into it here and there, but uh, drip edge, yes or no. If we're replacing drip edge, if the insurance company paid for it, get a color from your ABC uh, trim coil swatch or whatever aluminum swatch we're using. Currently, usually it's probably gonna be that ABC trim coil. Um, gutter apron um, that goes on anywhere that uh, gutters are at. So it's, it goes on instead of drip edge. It's almost the same thing. It's just slightly different. Um, comes in a few colors, black, brown, teratone, which is kind of a gray uh, or white. Okay. Okay. Redeck home to cover space decking. Yes or no. Uh, this is going to be more common on homes that were built 1960s or earlier. So when you take the shingles off, 
we'll find um, two by 10 or two by eight boards instead of plywood. Um, to meet code and meet GAF or Owens Corning install guidelines, we've got to install new OSB on the top of that space decking, right? Um, so the, the new OSB is gonna sit up an extra half inch or five eighths of an inch taller because we're, we're doing an overlay, right? We're not gonna take off the existing space decking. We're just gonna overlay new OSB on top of the existing decking. So what happens is the roof now, the entire roof sits about a half inch higher. Well, if the roof meets any sidewalls, we're gonna have to cut the existing siding back. If it's cedar, no problem. We'll cut it back, we'll install a trim board, right? And we'll paint it to match. If it's steel or aluminum siding, well, you, it's not that simple. You can't just cut it back. I mean, you can, but then we'll have to redo the whole section on that wall, right? Well, if it's aluminum, um, it's a good chance you can't match that siding, right? So we gotta make sure that, hey, you know, this is something we wanna check out before we're ordering the roof, right? And it's something we wanna know, um, does this home have space decking? Is this house gonna have to be redecked when we get ready to do the roof out here? If so, we gotta take some photos from the garage or from the attic. Um, so that way we can send it to an insurance company, make sure they're aware of it. That way we can get it approved. And then we want to find out, hey, is this a client that has matching with their insurance company? Because if a roof meets a sidewall and we have to cut some of that siding back, what happens if we can't match the siding? So there's a lot of complexities that can come up when you've got space decking at play, right? So uh, this is something, you know, we have to check all those things out before we go and show up to build a roof. We have to have a plan right um, because if the homeowner has discontinued siding we're cutting siding back and you can't match it we got a problem on our hands right um, what are we going to put back on you know all of a sudden now you know we have to replace some of their siding siding's discontinued their insurance company won't pay for all the siding on the house well what are we going to do to match right make the house look right um, or some insurance companies out there won't pay. They won't pay to, to redact the home. They don't care that it's a code required item or code required issue, they, they won't do it. So, you know, what happens then? Who's gonna cover the cost? We don't wanna have to pass a five, six, seven, eight thousand dollar cost on to a client as a surprise. It's not good for us, it's not good for them. So, um, you know, the space decking stuff, again, it's serious stuff but you're really only gonna find it on homes built in the 1960s or prior. Um, I think by the 70s, 80s, it was phased out and, and for the roof decking, you had plywood so that then you don't really have to worry about it. But um, so anyway, um, that's something to watch out for. Um, but if you're working newer homes, you don't have to worry about it. Um, okay, metal vents, valleys, and roofing accessories colors. Um, most of the time, depending on the roof, um, the supply company has a standard color that they would send out um, along with that shingle. So if it's uh, like pewter gray, for example, they'll, they'd send out black roof vents and valley metal. Charcoal would be black roof vents and valley metal. Bark wood uh, or hickory would be um, brown roof vents, right? Um, weathered wood, I believe is teratone. So you'd have teratone, which is kind of a grayish, um, uh, grayish valleys and, and roof vents, but you've only got a couple different colors, right? You got black, brown, teratone, and then galvanized. I don't know if galvanized is really even an option, but we ask because, uh, every once in a while, somebody will want something that's different than whatever the manufacturer would typically recommend, right? You know, you could have a, a brown shingle like bark wood or hickory, and instead of sending a brown vent out, um, maybe the homeowner wants black, right? Um, so it, it, usually it's not too big of a deal, but uh, again, if it's something we can confirm, then why not, right? Here you go, and uh, just for quantity of turtle vents, ridge venting, yes or no, 
turbine vents quantity. So this is just all about ventilation, powered vent covers. Um, those are big, huge vents. Usually you see them on, uh, you see them here and there. And, and uh, you gotta be careful when you're measuring the base of those. So that way you get the right size. Um, here's a big one, chimney flashing replace, yes or no, right? Well, if there's chimney flashing and if it's rusted out or if it's in bad shape, we're going to replace it basically every time. Um, and we're going to put new step flashing in and then we're going to put a counter flashing called riglet over the top of it. Um, we want to know the riglet color, right? And riglet comes in the same as your, your roof vent colors. You got brown, black, teratone, or uh, I don't even know if they do it in gal galvanized, but I would just call it brown, black, or teratone, which is kind of gray. Is there step flashing on brick or stucco? Um, if we need to put some of that in, or let's say you're doing space decking, we're going to put new decking on over top of some space decking on a house and the sidewall is brick or stucco. Well, guess what? We have to put new step flashing in. We're gonna have to put step flashing in and then we're gonna have to install riglet into that brick or stucco, right? Or sometimes, you know, uh, a couple weeks ago, there was a home up in Maple Grove, re-roofed it. The front of the entire house was brick. They didn't have any step flashing behind the brick. The guy was getting a leak in one of his bay windows. There's a little uh, kind of roofing eyebrow above his bay window. He was getting a leak. We looked at it, we told them, hey, you don't have any step flashing behind there. The, the builder built the house without any step flashing behind the brick and, the, and the, the roof. So there was a seam where the roof met the brick wall and water was coming right into that seam. So what did we do? We told them, hey, we'll, we'll have to, I mean, we have to at this point, we have to install some step flashing with, uh, with Riglet to meet code. We told him he understood. We put the, the step flashing in. We put the riglet on. Well, his wife come home, comes home and she doesn't like it. She doesn't like the riglet cover. And, um, you know, we told her, we said, hey, you know, um, you know, I don't know what to say. I mean, at this point, it's it's a code issue. You know, whether whether you like it or not, you know, I understand. But we, this is what we had to install. You have to have step flashing. And, you know, we're not going to take the brick off and put it behind the brick. We're going to put the step flashing on the front of the brick and then cover it with a riglet covering. It's the only way you can do it in this case. There's no other option. So it's, you know, and it's pretty, really, it's pretty common. It's just she wasn't used to it. You know, it's, it's like anything, you know, you get something done in the house and you're used to it looking one way for 25 years all of a sudden it looks a little bit different and you know it takes a couple weeks to get used to it but really it doesn't it's not anything that looks bad it's just you know sometimes people get picky but anyway it's something we have it on here because we want to have these conversations before right before the fact you can you know everything is okay as long as it's not a surprise once you have surprises well sometimes people don't like surprises this is why we discuss this stuff, right? And the riglet color, you want to, you know, if somebody's got brick or stucco, you might want to give them some options on the color. Do they want brown? Do they want black? Do they want the gray? Um, do they want us to install it and then paint it? You know, I mean, we, there's a lot of different options, right? So anyway, we're going down. We got kitchen vents, quantity, bathroom vents, chimney cricket replaced, yes or no. That's if you got like a metal... Um, Behind a chimney, you'll have a little metal kind of diverter. Sometimes they get rusted out. Usually what we'll do is we'll just put a new one in. We'll build it out of wood and then cover it nice and water shield and then shingle over the top of it. Um, if you're doing metal ones, you got to find a way to, to custom order a metal chimney cricket. And it's a little trickier. So uh, rain diverters, those are big, long strips. Usually you'll see them above a front door, a patio door. It, it, it stops the rain from rolling down over that door. You, you, you put them in the roof, um, kind of in lieu of a gutter. Um, but it's just a big strip that diverts the rain, you know, um, to a different area. Um, so we want to know the, the quantity, the color, the length and location. Um, chimney Cricket, oh, we talked about that, excuse me. We got cornice returns. So in cornice returns, and some of this stuff is a little tricky to kind of talk about. Um, 
without having some photos, but cornice returns, usually you'll see on bigger houses. So you'll see them at the end of the gable. Um, a lot of times above garages or the front elevation, um, but they're a, a part at the end of the gable um, where there's extra shingling um, kind of around the box return. And it's an area that's gotta be kind of, the shingles have to be hand cut, extra ice and water has to be applied. But usually the fascia will butt right up to the shingles and when they're tearing shingles out, sometimes that fascia can get bent, right? And so, it says right here, fascia may be damaged in these areas during a re-roof. Additional charges may need to be supplemented or applied for replacement of fascia. So sometimes there's no way to replace the shingles in that area without damaging the fascia. And, and that's what we're talking about here. So we ask you to get a fascia width and profile and color, right? Um, so um, sometimes what happens is we take shingles off on a cornice return, the fascia gets damaged, the homeowner gets upset. Oh, you damaged my house, you damaged my fascia. You guys did a bad job. They don't realize, well, actually, no, that's just kind of, there's a second phase of the project. We couldn't get those shingles out without damaging that fascia. We're gonna have to supplement insurance for it. You know, we'll come out, they'll approve it. We'll replace that fascia, no problem. Um, you know, sometimes the fascia actually gets cocked to the shingling. So, um, anyway, um, PVC pipe boots, that's your flashing around plumbing pipes. As for size and quantity, same thing. There's metal plumbing pipe jackets, same deal there. Replacing skylights, yes or no? Um, if it's yes, um, we've got to figure out a couple different things. We want the interior opening size, ideally. It's gonna be the most accurate. Sometimes you won't be able to get that. So on your roof scope form, you'll get the exterior size. In the interior size, you can kind of approximate when you're on the roof. You can usually kind of look at the glass size. Um, the big thing with skylights is the standard sizes that were used, you know, say 10, 15 years ago or however old the skylights are, those standard sizes can be a little different than what's currently offered. So we might have to order a skylight that's close in size, but it might not fit exactly how the previous one did. So when we put the new skylights on, we might have to go in and trim out the inside to make up for any differences in size. Um, or sometimes, you know, you can have issues with the existing sheetrock, it'll crumble. Um, you know, crack while well, you know what, no problem. We'll go out, we'll trim those new skylights out so that way the inside looks good. Um, all of the skylights we order nowadays are from Velux, that's the manufacturer. Um, the interior comes standard in white, okay? Um, if somebody does not want white, we have to get natural, right? It's special order, okay? So it takes a month to get natural um skylights that aren't white so white is the standard um if that doesn't work not a big deal but we got to wait a month we'll get the natural ones okay um there's a couple other things that can come up too with skylights sometimes they can actually be a venting skylight that opens up most common is fixed meaning the skylight doesn't open but sometimes you can have a venting skylight if it vents there's a couple different ways it can open it might be a manual crank. Uh, it could be hardwired to open, or it could be a solar powered. And it looks like we actually made a mistake here. We did not include manual um, on there for an option, but uh, most of them are actually powered anyway. But anyway, this is the skylight specs. We wanna make sure we're ordering the right stuff, okay? Now, if a homeowner has skylights on the house, and they're choosing not to replace them during the re-roof, they have to sign this skylight waiver. So it just says, hey, if you're choosing not to replace your skylights for whatever reason, you gotta waive any liability to Summit for any future leaks, right? So they have to initial that. Um, it's just because if we're not replacing the skylight and 
um, doing the uh, ice and water shield around the skylight and, and actually installing it, we're not going to warranty it because it wasn't our work to begin with, right? Um, so now we're talking about branded gutter toppers. There's another question here. Are there gutter helmet branded toppers present? Yes or no? If yes, are they being replaced or detached and reset? Choose one or the other. Well, with gutter helmet brand gutter toppers, we're not allowed to detach and reset those, right? If they're going to be replaced, no problem. We can rip them off. Gutter helmet will go out there after the roof is done, and they'll just put new ones on, right? If insurance is paying to replace them. But if insurance is not paid to replace those gutter helmet branded toppers, Summit or any other company is not allowed to detach and reset those gutter helmet toppers because it voids the gutter helmet warranty. So this is why we ask, right? The other reason we ask is they're super expensive. So it's a mistake we can't afford to make. Uh, so for gutter helmets, you're looking at about $30 a foot. That's right, per foot, um, not cheap. So if, you know, for example, maybe you get a roof approved on wind damage and not hail. If, it, if you get a roof approved on hail and they have gutter helmet, most of the time the gutter helmet's gonna be damaged too. Insurance will pay for them because they'll be dented up. And so, you know, we end up getting gutter helmet out to replace them, right? Well, let's say you get a roof approved based on wind damage, there's no hail damage to the property. Well, let's say there was like, uh, you know, four or five missing shingles, shingles discontinued, we get the whole roof approved but they have gutter helmet on the house. Well, guess what? We have to get gutter helmet to go out and detach the gutter because, or, excuse me, detach the gutter helmet because they weren't paid for to be replaced, right? The gutter helmet has to go out and detach the gutter helmet. We build the roof and then gutter helmet goes back out and reattaches the same gutter helmet. And then we supplement insurance for it. Right? Or if it's retail, we bill the client accordingly. Um, now, let's say you've got another situation where insurance pays for the gutter guard or the topper, um, but the homeowner doesn't want to replace it. If it's gutter helmet, they have to do it because the way the gutter helmets specifically are installed, there's no way we can replace the roof without peeling the gutter helmet back. If they've got generic gutter guards or toppers, it's not an issue. Usually those don't extend very far into the roof decking, so we can take the shingle off, keep those same gutter guards on there, and replace the uh, the roof, no problem, right? But the homeowner has to sign a waiver if they don't want to replace them, stating that we're not responsible for any damage to those gutter guards or toppers, right? Um, because there, there's just a lot of shingling coming off the roof, if the homeowner chooses to not replace those items, no problem, but it's just not reasonable for us to have to work around those. Um, when you consider the, the nature and the weight of shingles and, and just the nature of roofing in general, um, you know, it, those gutter guards could get scratched or dented or whatever, you know, all in all, they should fare just fine through the process. But, you know, you get a picky homeowner or someone you know, that gets upset about one scratch, it's like, well, you know, we don't want to get stuck replacing their gutter guard, uh, especially if insurance has already agreed to, to pay for them and the homeowner just doesn't want to do them, right? Another thing, we've got a plant, tree, and shrub waiver. Um, we're going to try to protect shrubs, plants, trees, grass, um, right? We don't have the intention of trying to go out and, and damage that stuff. You know, we always want to protect the property. Uh, just sometimes it's just not possible, right? You know, or you're roofing, you're high up, you're on a steep roof, stuff falls. You know, gravity is at play. Shingles will fall off the roof. Debris is going to fall off the roof. Um, you know, sometimes you're going to have some plants or some shrubs that get damaged. Or if there, there's plants or shrubs all the way around a house, you know, you have drop off points for certain shingles, depending on how the roof is constructed. Sometimes there's just nothing we can do. You know, this is a construction project. Um, 
you know, re-roofing is a lot more difficult than doing new construction work where a homeowner doesn't live in the house. There's no landscaping, you know, uh, it's a brand new house. Well, when you're re-roofing, you got to work around a lot of stuff. It's a little trickier. Um, and some of these things, plants, trees, shrubs, they will grow back. Um, so, you know, the homeowner does have, uh, you know, they, they've got to be willing to sacrifice or take on some small element of risk, right? We don't want to build a roof and then show up and, you know, have someone try and ding us or get a discount because their bush got damaged. Now they want a thousand dollars on the roof, off the roof, you know, as a discount, it just, it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, it, it would be unreasonable. Uh, but again, we will try and protect all that stuff. Um, we've got a dumpster waiver. Same thing here. Um, homeowner has to sign this to waive any liability to summit for driveway damage due to dumpster drop off or removal. Um, dumpster company will put boards below the dumpster, but again, you know, we don't control how their driveway was made, poured, manufactured. We don't know the condition of the ground below their driveway. There's a lot of other factors. Um, you know, when we drop a dumpster off and put shingles in it, it's going to weigh, you know, six, seven, eight tons, right? It's a lot of weight. Um, and, uh, we just, you know, there's no other way to do it, right? It's not like we can just take the shingles and, and throw them on the ground, right? We can get trailers. That is an option too. But, you know, again, you don't know, you can get a trailer out there on wheels. You can't guarantee that something won't happen from that, right? So, uh, again, we've got to go out and do our job and, um, we don't want to be threatened, you know, over some of these different things that can come up that are beyond um, reasonable control uh, for Summit to protect, right? So we've got a dumpster waiver. Um, <coughs> excuse me. We've got the work guidelines down here. I'm not going to read through all these. This is just kind of some basic stuff. Um, talks about ice and water uh, application. Um, existing ice and water shield won't be removed. Uh, all existing shingles will be removed as best as possible. Existing nails will be removed or driven in to prepare a flat and smooth nailing surface. Dormer flashing won't be replaced. Um, new riglet may have waves or creases after installation. This is normal and to be expected. Um, so uh, again, we're just kind of, some of these things are common things people have brought up. Um, in the past as concerns and um, you know we outline them here for transparency trying to set the proper expectations um, obviously here's another one uh, client family members or guests should not be walking on the property um, so there we go um, okay the final thing we'll talk about here the pricing how do you fill this out right total price so I've got this example and take a quick peek here. So this is just a simple roof. It's a pretty good example actually on this one. So this is a small roof. You can see here dwelling, we've got a bunch of roofing line items. Well, in this particular estimate, for whatever reason, it's written in Xactimate, but the insurance company didn't do a roof category. They, they totaled it all under right elevation, which is kind of weird. So there's a bunch of items that happen to be in this little category that are not roofing related, right? So we've got to go through and we're going to subtract those. So uh, on this contract, what we want to do is we want to put the replacement cost value here for the cost, right, under total price. But in this particular case, we don't wanna put this number because it's not accurate. There's a bunch of stuff that just doesn't pertain to the roof, right? So we're gonna go through and we're gonna separate that out. We got downspout, plastic. Well, here, we'll start at the top. Remove rain cap, rain cap six inch. That's part of the furnace, right? So we're gonna take both those things off. We're gonna go through here, 20 year shingle, remove aluminum rake, gable edge trim. So that's basically your drip edge. Aluminum rake, gable edge trim. We got more, but then they have drip edge too. That's kind of weird. 
but that's probably some of this is probably um like drip edge but a little bit different so we're just gonna leave that in for now uh roofing felt ice and water shield we've got gutter guard and screen so that's not part of the roof remove gutter plastic downspout that's not part so here we go we've got about one two three no excuse me this stays in we got one two three four five items not related to the roof not that should not be included in this 10,144, right? I'm also gonna highlight these over here on the ACV side, because that's how we're gonna calculate our down payment for the roof, okay? So here we go. I'm gonna take 10,144, 0.58, Minus 451 minus 39 minus 155.86 minus 4131 minus 49464. There we go. So we're at 9409.47. Okay, that's what we're gonna write in here, 9409.47. So pretty cheap roof, not a great one. You can actually look here and see 23 squares. We're gonna call it 26. We go with the replace amount with the waste. So we're gonna see what price are we at per square here. We're at 9409. We're gonna divide that by 26 square. So we're at 361 a square. Now this this is actually from a couple years ago, so it's not a current example. But 361 a square is not even buildable, so we would have to go through this estimate and see what the insurance company is missing. I mean, we would do that anyway, um, but we typically want to be at bare minimum 375 at bare minimum, right, for your most basic simple roof. Uh, but re really, 400 is kind of the the actual minimum threshold, 400 per square for a, uh, you know, a, a basic roof with not a lot of hip or valley or no complex facets, you know, uh, not steep, you know, walkable. Um, that's kind of the, the bottom end, you know, and ideally we want to be a little higher. We want to be around that 450, 500 a square really is where we, we want to be. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it all depends on the roof and, and, and what components are involved and how many uh, facets and complexities you've got. But this is a good way to just kind of figure out, you know, hey, where are we at? You know, how, how nice does this roof look, right? This one's pretty low, so it's not great. Um, so that one will probably have to be re-supplemented, re right? Re-exactimated. Okay, well, we've got our total cost, right? But we want to figure out what's the down payment. The down payment we're gonna collect is the actual cash value of the roof or the work that we're gonna do. So right here, we've got 82.79, okay? What we're gonna do is we're gonna actually subtract some of these items, okay? So we're gonna subtract, we're gonna go 82.79.09. We're gonna subtract the same items that we did from the replacement cost value, any non uh, roof related item that happens to be incorrectly grouped in with the roof here or any item that's part of the roof that we're just not replacing, right? So again, we've got the, the rain cap here up on the top. So we're gonna go minus 451, minus 3343, Minus down here, this is for some gutter guard. Minus 116.89. Minus 41.31. Minus 395.72. There we go. 76.87.24. That's the down payment amount. 76.87. 24 and that's due on order 
So now um, we've gone through, we've filled this out. You know, really, I, I kind of went through and explained everything. Really, guys, this should take you five, 10 minutes tops to go through this with the, the client, fill this out. Some of this stuff you can even fill out uh, before you're sitting down with the client. You can show up in your car, be there early, fill this stuff out, um, you know, have it ready, go through it with the client, confirm the details, the colors, the dumpster location, um, you know, some of that stuff, um, and then uh, have them sign off, right? Client signs down here. Oh, actually, client signs on top. You sign right here. And that's it. And then you collect your, your check from the client, submit it all to the office, and boom, we're ready to order. So anyway, um, that's it for now, guys. Uh, you know, kind of a long video again, but uh, I think it's worth the watch. Um, should explain some things and the time you guys spend kind of keying in on some of this stuff now. It's going to make you a better sales rep and uh, you'll close more deals in the future. All right, guys. See you on the next one. Bye-bye.